So I'm Melissa Pace and I'm the PA that works with Dr. Thompson. Some of you may have already met Peter Ree, who's the PA that works with Dr. Remington and Dr. Howe. And so we created this seminar to allow our spine fusion patients a chance to know more about what they're going to have done, learn how to prepare. And so the conference will be about 45 minutes. And then at the end, we'll have plenty of time for questions and we'll talk about some anatomy and I'll pass around some hardware and things like that. So, so like I said, we're going to be talking about how to prepare yourself for surgery and what to expect while you're here and then what to know about what will be expected of you once you go home. So you may have already been given a date of your surgery. Uh, the time of your surgery is something that we wait until the very last minute to solidify. So you'll be getting a call from the medical assistants telling you what time to be there. That phone call is usually the week before your surgery. So um, our schedule changes a lot, so we just like to make one phone call to you. So the medical assistants will be giving you that information. You may have been asked to see your primary care provider and uh, we will get all the notes from them and any lab work or tests that they did, we'll be getting those results from them. If you're fairly healthy, you may have been asked to see the STAR clinic downstairs and so um, we also are able to obtain information from them as well. So uh, it just kind of depends on your past medical history what we require you to do before surgery. So uh, as, as you're ready to come in for surgery, uh, you'll need to make sure that you stop all your anti-inflammatories. So we ask that you stop those 10 to 14 days ahead of time. Some surgeons say five days is okay. Um, there's a full list of your anti-inflammatories in your book. Now this also includes some herbal supplements, so things like uh, ginkgo, uh, ginseng, glucosamine, those all have properties that can make you bleed a little bit more than we'd like, so those are also things that need to be stopped ahead of time. If you're on any sort of blood thinner, uh, that you'll need to discuss with your primary care provider as to when and if you can stop those medications. So as you're coming in for surgery, the morning of surgery, most medications you can still take. Um, blood pressure medications you can take with a small sip of water. Um, most pain medications you can actually still take the morning of surgery. So things like Vicodin and Percocet, those are okay to take the morning of surgery, again with just a small sip of water. Because we're going to have you not having anything to eat or drink after midnight the night before. So um, that's to make sure that you're going to be safely undergoing anesthesia. So, um, but most medications, like I said, you can take with a small sip of water. If there's a medication that you are unsure about, I'd be happy to answer questions afterwards or you can talk to your regular doctor as well. So we ask that you bring your medications with you when you come to the hospital. And that's not because we're going to be doling those out to you, but it's because when you check in, the nurses go through and check your bottle. They make sure that what dose you're taking, how often you're taking those medications, and then we provide those to you through our pharmacy. So um, a lot of patients, if you say, well, bring a list of medicines, it's not a full list. It doesn't give doses. It doesn't give strength, how, how often you take it. And so if you bring the bottles with you, then we know. The other reason to bring the bottles with you is because every once in a while someone's taking a medicine that we don't actually have here at the pharmacy, whether it be a brand name or generic, particularly things like Cinemet, for example. Some people do very well on the brand name, and that may be something that we don't have here. So that is another reason to have them here, just in case we need to actually use the medication from your bottle. If you have a CPAP machine, you'll need to bring that as well, and that's for patients who have sleep apnea. So um, diabetic medications are somewhat unique in that metformin is one that has to be stopped for 48 hours ahead of time and 48 hours after surgery. So if, if you're a diabetic who normally does not take insulin, after surgery, you may actually need to get some insulin because with the stress of surgery, and then we sometimes give you some steroids, 
that can elevate your blood sugars. So you may actually need a li little bit of insulin, whereas you don't normally do at home. So as you come to the hospital, you're going to be coming in through the main new lobby area that's all glass. There's a circular drive there. So you're going to pull your car up, and we actually have valet parking that's complimentary. So you can leave your car, and then you're going to come in through the doors, and, and on to the left, there's an admitting desk. And you'll get ch checked in, and then at that point, you'll be brought back to a small private room that we call our pre-op area. And so while you're in this private room, you're going to be meeting with lots of different people and they're going to be asking you the same things over and over again. What are your allergies? What surgeries have you had before? And you'll also have an opportunity to meet with your anesthesiologist. So this is a great time to tell them, you know, last time I had surgery, I was very nauseated afterwards or if you had any other complications with your anesthesia in the past, you should tell them because sometimes they're able to look that information up and tailor the anesthesia to you, to you individually. If you have been confused in the past when you've had anesthesia, that's something that doesn't tend to get better. That's something that tends to happen every time you have anesthesia. So you'll want to make sure to tell your friends and family you know, I've had this problem with confusion in the past, it will likely happen again, and that way they'll be aware of it and be better prepared for that. The, the other things they'll have you do in this area is that they'll have you change into a gown, and then we have these uh, scrub pads that they're going to have you wipe down with, and that's just to help to make absolutely sure we have the lowest infection rate that we can. So that's something new that we've started doing that they'll have everyone do. And then your surgeon will also meet with you. So he's going to be putting initials on your back, kind of an X marks the spot. And so if you have any last minute questions at that point, you'll, you'll have an opportunity to ask those too. So at that point, your friends and family will be with you there in that room. But then once we wheel you out of that room, obviously they won't be coming with you to the operating room. So as you are brought down to the operating room, uh, you'll either have an IV right before you come down or they'll put one in once we get to the operating room. And so um, once you're in the operating room, then you'll have the anesthesia applied and then you'll fall asleep. Once you're asleep, then we're able to put the catheter in and position you on our operating room table. So there's lots of people in this room, obviously your anesthesiologist, your surgeon, and then an assistant, either myself or Dr. Chilzik or Peter. And then there's a nurse that's helping us, and then there's somebody that hands us instruments, and then there's somebody that's operating our x-ray machine. So there'll be a whole group of people there. So this is what our operating room looks like. These are our new operating rooms. They're nice and big. And the patient is laying under this blue sheet and they're laying face down, and everything you see in blue is sterile. So this is the x-ray machine that's taking pictures as we're working and as we're putting the hardware in place. And then um, that's the surgeon, and then you require someone to assist on the other side. So this is what the bed looks like that the patient uh, will be laying on. And so you lay face down with your arms out to the side. So this pillow is the pillow that supports your face. And then your body is draped over this arch. And that allows us better access to your back. And then your knees are slightly bent on these pillows. And so every piece, part of your body that's going to be laying down is padded and has a jelly cushion under it to make sure it, it doesn't get injured during the procedure. So we have a tray of instruments out. And so this slide often scares people. I had a guy pass out two weeks ago <laughs> when I showed this. So if you're feeling faint, tell me. Uh, but all of this is laid out, and it looks like your workshop out back. It's got screws and hammers and, and all the tools that we need to work with while we're doing your surgery. So the length of your surgery is pretty variable on what you're having done, uh, if you've had surgery before. Obviously, if you've had surgery before, there may be scar tissue where we need to be working, and so we have to be extra careful around that, and that takes a little bit more time. 
Uh, if you have more than one level being done, that can add additional time to the surgery. So we'll talk about in the end how to number the levels that you're having done. But typically a one level surgery is about an hour and a half and each additional level adds anywhere from a half an hour to an hour. So that is just your surgical time. So that's only the time that we are working on your back. That doesn't include all that time up front where we're getting you positioned and all the time we wait for you to kind of start waking up on your own and then you go to recovery. So you need to make sure you tell your friends and family that you're actually going to be downstairs a good part of the day, you know, four to six hours really, so that they're prepared for that. Most friends and family choose to leave the campus area here during the surgery and we give them a call on the cell phone and say everything went great, um, patients in recovery, that kind of thing. So, so that's up to each person uh, in particular. You're also welcome to stay uh, in the hospital too if you'd like. There's lots of sitting areas here. So after you go to the recovery room then you're going to come up here to our spine floor and this is our great new spine floor that uh, has just joints and spines. So that's all that we do on this floor. So the only patients on this floor are patients who have just had surgery. And so all our nurses are particularly trained for that type of patient. So they're very used to seeing, seeing our patients. They know what we expect. They know our preferences and watch each surgeon. If there's something in particular that they like, they're aware of that. So um, this is kind of the sitting area up front that you saw when you got off the elevator. And there's a little uh, lounge area here too that has coffee and, and juice and tea. And then these are the rooms. And so each of our rooms are private. So uh, each patient will have a hospital bed. So the railings will come up on the bed. And you can use those railings to position yourself and help pull yourself over in bed. Uh, we let you sleep however you'd like, so whether that be on your back or your side or even your stomach, if you prefer, you're welcome to do that. So we also have menus, so the way that we have patients order food here is that you pick up the phone and you dial menu and then you order your food. The phones turn on at 7 in the morning, so everybody calls at 7. So if you would like your uh, breakfast early, you should call the night before and pre-order it and then they can just bring it to the room and then you don't have to sit on hold. But that's up to you. So we have internet, we have a get well network where you can uh, listen and watch for other procedures that are done at this hospital. So we also have private showers in these rooms. So we let our fusion patient shower on the second day. So if you'd like to do a shower, um, someone can assist you with that. So as you wake up from the surgery, uh, anesthesia will sometimes uh, have, you'll be nauseated with the anesthesia. You may have a little bit of blurry vision, dry mouth. All of those things are, are fairly normal. You may have trouble sleeping, especially that first night because we had you artificially asleep during the day. And so the nurses have lots of things that they can give to you to help with some of these things. If you have a dry mouth, they can give you a little lozenge. If you're having trouble sleeping, we can sometimes give you a little Benadryl to help with that. So communicate to the nurses if there's something uh, going on, something that you'd like to be treated for. So um, when you wake up, you'll have lots of different things uh, attached to you. You'll have the oxygen, and that uh, requires two, uh, cannula to be into your nostrils. It's a little uncomfortable because it dry thing, dries things out, but we ask that you leave it in as long as you can tolerate it because we know that the higher your oxygenation levels, the lower your complication risk. So the nurses will tell you when it's okay to remove that. You'll also have one or two drains coming from your back. Those stay in for two days, so that'll be something that they'll clip to your gown. And then you'll also have a catheter, and that comes out the morning after surgery. So slowly over the first two days that you're here, you'll have things kind of slowly removed and feel more human. Um, so typically then that second day, yes? How many days are you in there? Three days. Mm -hmm. So you go home that third morning. So 
Uh, the second day, when we remove your drains, they'll also be changing your bandage. So after surgery, we put a pretty thick bandage back there, and it'll feel like a fullness, like a brick that you're laying on. And so that second day, then, that's removed and a much smaller bandage is put in place. So we talk a little bit about pain because these can be painful procedures, and we want everyone to know what to expect. So we use lots of different things to treat pain. We not only use pain medicines, but we also use muscle relaxants, and we also can provide you with a bag of ice, things like that to help make you feel more comfortable. Uh, we also sometimes need to use nerve medications. If you have a new area of, of uh, kind of burning leg pain, we may use a little bit of nerve medication to help with that. That's fairly rare, but it does sometimes happen. Uh, and then we also use Tylenol. So when we do pain medicines here, we have found that by splitting up the narcotic and the Tylenol, then we can help individualize your dosing of the pain medicine. So you may have noticed that if you're on something like Vicodin or Percocet, that's a tablet that has both narcotic and Tylenol built into it. The reason that they do that is because the Tylenol works synergistically with that narcotic. It makes it last longer and it makes it stronger. So while you're here, we have to limit how much Tylenol you get because if you take, over more, if you take more than 4,000 milligrams, that can injure your liver. So here, yes? What happens if you can't? Then you don't get any. Yep, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then we just cut it out completely. So. Uh, we're able to that way really have some flexibility with how we use your narcotic without having to worry about the Tylenol component of it. So that'll be something to remember as you go home. If you notice uh, that your narcotic doesn't have Tylenol in it, that's something that the nurses may advise you to take in addition to your pain medicine to help boost it a bit. Okay. So. Uh, we use a scale when we talk about pain. So the nurses are going to be coming into the room and they're going to say, what level is your pain? Where is your pain at? And this is the scale that they're talking about. So zero is happy face, zero, no pain. Ten is the worst burning flesh, poker in the eye pain you could ever imagine. So you can't say your pain's a 15. You have to actually use the scale. So. You know, it'd be rare to be down in this area, but we don't want you to be way up here either. So our goal for you is to be right in the middle where you're gonna be comfortable enough to get up and work with physical therapy, but not so comfortable that you're sleeping and you don't wanna talk to us. So it's a very fine line for some people. So every day we make adjustments to that. Every day we may try something different we may try timing the medicine a little bit differently just so that we can help uh, maintain a comfort level that's, that's not a lot of this up and down pain, but kind of steady and controlled. And so don't be afraid to tell the nurse that you're having pain. You know, we're not here to judge anyone. Our nurses treat pain all day long. We want you to communicate with us what you're feeling because sometimes if we even uh, treat it before it gets really severe, then it's a lot easier and then we don't have a lot of those ups and downs, but we can kind of uh, cut it off at the pass, okay? So uh, risks, so any surgery has risks involved and we just briefly touch on these and infection can be a big one. You're gonna have hardware in your back so we don't want you to have an infection. So you get antibiotics before, during, and after surgery. So our infection rate is very low here. It's uh, less than 4%, which is lower than the national average. And so um, infections can occur when you go home. So some people can have an infection that creeps up two weeks after surgery. So sometimes your incision will drain a little bit of blood. That doesn't necessarily mean it's infected, uh, but we typically do wanna know about that and wanna take a look at it and make sure. Uh, so the uh, antibiotics do a very good job of preventing an infection. So blood clot, a blood clot can occur in your, in your calf and break off and go to your lungs and be a pulmonary embolus. 
And so to prevent that from happening, when you get to the operating room, they'll put some squeezers on your legs and those will still be on when you're up here in your room. So if, if you're in your room and you sense that they're there but you don't feel them squeezing, let somebody know so that they can check the connection, make sure the machine's working appropriately. Uh, then we also have you get up and move a lot and we, we get you up fairly quickly and that also helps prevent a blood clot. Pneumonia. Pneumonia can occur because as you're laying face down we give you lots of fluids and you can get some fluid that accumulates in your lungs. So that's another reason we get you up and move you pretty quickly afterwards because that helps to mobilize all those fluids. And the nurses will also give you a little apparatus that you'll suck into and that also helps to prevent that from happening. So constipation isn't really a risk, it's going to happen to everyone. So we give you about 12 different things to help move that along, but most patients don't have that first bowel movement until right before they go home on that third day. So the nurses will work with you on that. They may need to go from both ends to get that to go. So we'd rather do that here in the hospital than have your family member do that for you at home. So, so that's why we like to have that happen before you head home. So you will still have issues after you leave, but usually it's that first one that's the hardest to get going. And then after that, pretty much people do okay with just using a little stool softener, a little stimulant at home, and, and we give everyone to that for that to go home with. But there are some other ideas in your book. If that isn't enough, uh, you can check your book and for these other things that you can get over the counter if you're having problems at home with that. So the physical therapists see our patients every day. And so their role is to get you up and to walk with you and they will even do stairs with you before you go home. So their job is to figure out, well, what kind of uh, uh, assistance do you need walking? Do you have to have somebody standing right there or can you walk kind of freely on your own? Do you need a walker? They'll help you decide that. And then they'll also help decide if you can go home, if you're going to be safe to go home. Most of our patients after these surgeries do go home. Rarely uh, there'll be a patient who might be a little bit slower to get moving and the therapist feels they need someone else kind of keeping an eye on them. And that may be somebody who requires a rehab facility. Uh, so I typically have everyone know of at least one place, have one place in mind where you may have had a friend or family member go after for rehabilitation. You likely won't need that place, but just in case, I have you have that in mind. And then our discharge planners help plan all of that out for you, if necessary. So the, the other therapist that's going to be seeing you is the occupational therapist. Now that has nothing to do with your job. That's someone who figures out what kind of tools you're going to need. Do you need a reacher, a grabber, a shower chair? Um, they're going to show you how to get dressed, how to wipe yourself, how to take showers. And so um, they're also a very important role here on our floor. So the physical therapist will help show you what, what you can and can't do. Now we don't put a lot of restrictions on our fusion patients because we don't want you to be afraid to move. But most patients who think they're coming into a fusion think they're going to be leaving here like a robot and they can't move anything. But that's actually not true. So if you think about it, bending at the waist up to 90 degrees, that's all at your hips. So that's not actually moving your back. So patients actually find that once they recover from the surgery, their range of motion, their ability to, to bend forward is, is better sometimes because they don't have that pain associated with movement. So, you know, typically uh, we don't say, you can't bend, you can't twist, you can't do this, but you need to keep in mind doing a twisting and a pulling or a lifting is probably not a good idea and you have to be smart about your movement. So if you, if you have something you want to pick up, you want to square up to it, bend your knees, squat down and bring it close to your body and stand up. So uh, a week after surgery, you're not going to be out lifting bags of cement, I would hope. But at the same time, you know, if you want to start with something easy, a gallon of milk, for example, um, those kinds of things you can try out on your own. And as you 
go home, the typical routine for a patient is that that first week you're walking in your home, the second week you may make one or two trips outside, and by the third week uh, then you may have made one or two trips out uh, shopping in the community. So that's the typical uh, recovery for patients. Now some people are slower than that, some patients are longer than that. But you need to keep that in mind that, that your body may not be recovering as quickly as your brain wants you to. So that's something to remember afterwards. So um, the incisions and the way that we close the incisions, we do a dissolvable stitch underneath the skin and then we put Steri strips over that. So uh, the Steri strips fall off on their own. You're going to find them in your bed, in your shower, in your hall. They're going to be kind of everywhere. Just let them fall off and then what you'll be left with is two strings from either end and those strings also fall off on their own but they usually take about four weeks. So I will typically clip the incisions, uh, clip the sutures afterwards if it's still there for you. Um, you're not going to need a lot of incision care. Uh, it is nice if you can have somebody checking on your incision every day just to see how it looks day to day. And then um, if the incision looks unusual, then you can give us a call and if you want someone else to look at it, we'd be happy to help you with that. Um, the, the incision, you're not going to want someone to pull that string because that can hurt. That's underneath your skin. You're not going to want to have somebody putting a lot of goo in the incision. So uh, triple antibiotic ointment is not water soluble, so you just trap everything in there. So just leave it alone. It'll heal up on its own. And then if it itches, and it's going to because as the stitch dissolves, it will itch, you can use a little Benadryl ointment kind of around the area, but not in the incision itself. Or you can try a little Benadryl by mouth um, that's over the counter for that itching if you have it. Okay. Will we be sent home with the Benadryl ointment? Mm -mm. No, because, because not everybody has it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, staples are very rare, and if you have staples, we'll let you know. But, but it's likely that none of you will have staples. So as you're getting ready and thinking about how you can prepare for this surgery, you know that you're going to need somebody to drive you home. So you know that you'll most likely leave the third uh, morning after surgery. So you can go ahead and let somebody know that's when you're going to need a ride home. You're also going to need a ride back to our uh, clinic to, for follow-up. What keeps you from driving is pain medicines. <coughs> so. If you're taking a lot of narcotic pain medications, you obviously shouldn't be out driving around. So, so that's why you often will require rides uh, to our clinic afterwards. As far as getting things ready, you may want to pay all of your bills. Um, you want to make sure that you have things covered. If you have a dog that walks you every day, you want to have somebody else walking that dog. Uh, if you have a child that you're responsible for, someone else is going to have to help you with that temporarily. Um, and then those are all things that you'll slowly add back into your routine as you feel comfortable. So as you look around your house, if there's a rug you trip on, every time you come in the front door, you'll want to move that rug and get it out of the way. You'll want to look at your bathroom and make sure that it's wide enough to get a walker through in case you happen to ha be at home with a walker. If there's a hamper in the way, move the hamper ahead of time. You can get smaller trash bags. You can break up dog food into smaller bags, kitty litter into smaller bags, so that these are all things that you can kind of handle on your own afterwards. And those are all kinds of things to think about. Stairs, if you have stairs in your house, um, that's okay. The therapists do stairs with you before you leave. But if you do have a guest room that's on the same floor as your kitchen, you may want to think about moving temporarily into that room for the first week to 10 days um, until you really feel much more comfortable. So as you leave the hospital, you're going to have a prescription for pain medicines. We have a pharmacy downstairs where your ride can go and pick those up ahead of time so that you don't have to make an extra stop at the pharmacy. 
Um, you're going to be given <coughs> prescriptions for any sort of equipment you need, and that's also something that your ride could go pick up ahead of time so that it's available and, and ready for you. And then you'll have a follow-up appointment, and if for some reason your pre-scheduled follow-up appointment isn't a good time or you can't get a ride, just call us and let us know and we can work with you on that. So as you head home, we want you walking as much as possible. So um, like I said, at first that'll be in your home and then you'll start doing that outside. If it's crummy outside, you can certainly head to a mall and do a little bit of mall walking, which is nice because there's seats every few feet. Um, so that's something that we'll want you working on. Now people always come in after surgery and they ask all sorts of things. Well, when can I ride my motorcycle and when can I ride my l lawnmower and when can I ride a horse? So, you know, all of those things you'll eventually be able to do, but those will be later things. The things that we want you starting on are things like light dusting in your home or cleaning some dishes or starting to load the dishwasher. So those are all things that you can start doing. If you want to try laundry, you can do that, but you might want to do smaller loads that you can handle. So uh, like we talked about earlier, if you do have some drainage from your incision, uh, you may just want to give us a call and let us know and sometimes we'll start you on an antibiotic, sometimes we'll want to look at it, it just depends what's going on. Uh, but our medical assistants who answer our phone calls are very good at kind of fielding those kinds of calls. When you come back to our office and really anytime you come back to see us the first three months, if you wear elastic pants or a, or a dress, then we don't have to make you change your clothes because we will probably be getting an x-ray on you and we can't have metal in the x-ray. So if you have some pants that don't have metal zippers, um, that's great. Then we don't have to drag you all the way down, make you change your clothes, walk all the way back up to x-ray. That's just a lot of activity for you. So that's something to keep in but mind if too. If you don't, we have shorts. Some, right? Yeah, we have shorts and gowns. So the things that we absolutely don't want you doing is using a hot tub, swimming pool, swimming in the ocean, creek, lake, any sort of body of water for six weeks. And that's simply to prevent an infection. So um, your incisions will take that long to really become mature enough where you're beyond that risk. So showers are fantastic. You can shower as much as you want and you'll just pat your back dry but we don't want you submerged in water. So um, obviously after these surgeries, when we're working, we're working around a lot of nerves. And so um, after surgery, you may have one day that your foot hurts, the next day your buttock hurts, the next day your back hurts. That's very normal and we see a lot of that. If you have numbness now, you will probably still have numbness the first few months after surgery. Numbness is one of those things that takes a long time to recover. So what typically happens is that if you have an area of numbness on your leg, that will slowly get smaller and smaller. Or instead of being numb, it'll start to feel like little bee stings and it'll start to actually get more sensitive before it goes back to being normal. So if your area that used to be numb is more painful after surgery, that's actually a good sign because that suggests there might be some recovery there. But again, that's a long, slow process. So the numbness um, is something you'll have to be patient with. But pain is usually, uh, for example, leg pain is usually better pretty quickly after surgery. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about what we do during surgery. So. This is a lumbar spine, and it sits in your body like this. So this is your sacrum, and then you have five lumbar vertebra. So we number those L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, and then S1 is that first sacral vertebra. So if you're going to have an L5 to S1 fusion, that's a one-level fusion. We count the disc spaces and the discs are the spongy things that sit in between your bones. So if you're having an L4 to S1 fusion, that's a two-level fusion, okay? So you're going to be laying on our operating room table like this, and then we come and we make an incision down the middle of the back, 
and then we gently pull all of the muscles away off of the bone and then we're looking at the bones of your back. Now if you've had a laminectomy already, you're not going to have this bone anymore. But if you haven't had surgery before, we take this bone, remove it, and crunch it up and save it. And then we're looking at your nerves. And when we're looking at your nerves, then we can clean up any sort of narrowness that's around the nerves. So the nerves run down this canal and they each come out of these holes depending on which part of the leg they're traveling to. So we clean that out and make room for the nerve. And then we're able to put screws in. So the screws were getting right through this part of your bone. It's called the pedicle. So they're called pedicle screws. So you have two screws at each vertebra. So a one-level fusion has four screws. So once we have the screws in, we take that bone that we just crunched up and saved, and we hold your nerves out of the way, we remove this disc space, and we put some of that bone in there. And then we also put something in place of the disc. So it depends which surgeon you have, because it's surgeon preference, whether they put a piece of cadaver bone there or whether they put a metal cage. Okay? And then we take more of that bone and we stuff it along the sides here. So what we're basically doing is we're tricking your body into thinking that it has a broken bone and we're trying to get it to heal itself. So the, the hardware that's in, its whole purpose for being there is to hold you in place until your body heals that bone. And then once the bone is maturely healed, really this is irrelevant, the fact that you have metal there, but we don't go chipping it out because your body will kind of slowly grow bone over it. And it's a big deal to take it out. So it stays in for, for life. And um, when we put cadaver in this space, if you happen to have cadaver bone, you'll know it because as you leave the hospital, the nurses will give you a pamphlet that has a butterfly on it. And that's instructions on how to write a thank you note to the donor family. So that's something that's very nice to do. It gives families a lot of closure if they had a loved one who donated uh, their body. So that's uh, something that the nurses will show you. Uh, at, as you leave the hospital. So um, the metal that we use is titanium, so it doesn't typically go off at the airport. Um, with the new scanners, I'm not sure how they're addressing that, but we haven't been giving airport cards out to people. So most people just kind of show their incision and they wave the wand over you if, if it's picked up at all. Okay. So I'm going to pass this around so you can look at that. Now, so this bone's never put back? It, it is, but it's put back along here because we crunched it up right. and, and along the front. So it's missing this mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Is so that this is any jeopardy for mm -mm. getting... No, because your muscles then lay back over it and we sew them closed over it. And this is kind of a rudimentary piece of your bone that, that doesn't actually have a whole lot of function. So this you're, this is actually much deeper than you think it is in your back. You know, it's not sitting right there at the surface. For some people, it's four to six inches deep. So, so if you're a Dr. Remington patient, um, Dr. Remington will sometimes also use a large needle and pull just a little bit of bone marrow from your, from your iliac crest. And so uh, he'll let you know if you're one of those patients. But you'll sometimes have a little bit of aching in that area. So, so I'm going to pass around um, uh, the cadaver bone and then the cages that we use. So the cadaver bone that we use is highly processed to the point that all that remains is kind of the elements there. That, that your body does not identify as foreign. So there's no issues with rejection or that kind of thing because there's actually no identifying factors left on it. Um, it's simply the, the bone structure. So I'll pass these around. What did they use the cage for? So some of our surgeons use this cage, particularly Dr. Remington will use this cage. So this means Dr. Thompson mm -hmm. uses the cadaver. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, yeah. So. Who is Dr. Holland? 
He uses the cadaver bone typically as well. But you can ask each of your surgeons specifically which of those that they're going to be planning on using. In the um, Valley Voice here, there was an article on this. Uh -huh. Is that uh, is that being utilized? The structure there is um, like the ILIM procedure. Yeah, that is not this procedure. So that's a different procedure. There's very specific indications for that procedure, and so um, it depends on what your particular issue is. Um, but again, there's very specific patients that are candidates for that. So I'll pass these around as well. So these are our rods. Um, these come pre-cut, pre-sized. These are rather long rods. Most rods are about half of this length for a one-level fusion. So I'll pass these around so you can look at those. Does your height determine what size rod you need? It's your anatomy, right. So and not necessarily your height, but the distance between your bones. <laughs> so these are screws. Uh, this is a, a typical screw that we use. So screws are usually about 7 by 45 millimeters. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yes. bone freshly harvested? No, it's been processed, and as far as the timing, I can't give you that information. But but it's been. Uh, there's a company that then takes it and processes it, so it's kind of a long process before we get it. So. Sometimes, we'll sometimes use an awl or, and then um, a tool that has kind of a long uh, end to it that we can then kind of push through the bone. And that's what we're taking pictures of so that we can create this, mm -hmm. this channel for the screw to go down. And you, do you tap it or do you, you know? Sometimes we, one of the systems, it's tapped ahead of time. The other systems are self-tapping. So, yes. Is there a <coughs> difference in success recovery with way that Remington does it, Thompson does it, with using the cadaver and not using the No, it's, it's simply how you were trained and your preference as a surgeon. Yep. Any other questions? The um, drains? Mm -hmm. what, are they, what do they look like? How do they work? So the drain is a small plastic tube uh, that's, that uses just suction from, from the bulbs that we use. And the idea there is that we don't want a lot of fluid accumulating right next to your spine. And so the idea is that we're trying to keep that fluid out of there. And so um, those remain in until, they're drain until their output has decreased and then we're able to just remove them. They're not sewn in. Most people don't feel them as they're coming out. You, you probably won't, wouldn't even know they were there. Um, except for that you can see them. So they're not going to be like attached to the front or anything? They'll be, they'll be attached to your gown. Oh, to the gown. Yeah. When yeah. can you like switch into like normal pajamas? So you probably want to wait until the second uh, morning after surgery once they get the drains out of there just because, um, you know, you have, you know, if you have some bleeding from your IV, you don't want to get that on your pajamas. But you can have your normal pajamas here if you'd like for that final night here that's fine. Um, you can also bring your own pillow if you're more comfortable with your own pillow, that kind of the blankets. Bathroom? Mm -hmm. Flipper. You can bring, yep, yep. Okay. okay, let me just check my list. So that's everything. So if there, is there any other questions? Okay, well you're welcome to walk around the floor here and take a look. If you have parking that you need validated, uh, Lenora can park, can uh, stamp that for you up front here. So at the desk. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Oh, thanks. <laughs>